This voice right here is What's my that? favorite voice. Oh. Bear, what's up? What's up, brother? Um, so we've we've had some conversations a few times, but I want to do something just a little bit different. You got one of those on yours? No, I'm not cool. not that cool. Either. I can give you that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just run yours at the. I like that. Cool, so, man. I just want to sit down and just and just talk. Uh, not not tactical. Just anything. What okay. do you want to talk about? <sighs> man, I don't know. You got words on the inside of your hat? I do. What do they say? Shema Yisrael, Yahuwah Elohim, Yahuwah Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. I feel like you've probably said that before. I got a little bit of. Practice. You didn't just look up. No, no. It's uh, it's an interesting interpretation. Um, our friends, our brothers and sisters at Sanctified Supply Co. I'm familiar. Make this house, make this hat rather. And um, the Shema, it's uh, considered like the, the holiest, most sanctified prayer in all the Bible. And um, you're supposed to keep the Father's word as frontlets between your eyes, right? And so the Jews will, like Orthodox Jews will literally make a little box and they'll write this on a scroll, and they'll tie it to their head. Mm. Well, instead of that, I was like, well, we're us. We're kind of like homestead tactical, you know. And so Pastor Joe, uh, Viking Preparedness, five years ago I met him, and he had sharpied that underneath the bottom of his hat. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then Sanctified picked up on that and started screen printing it underneath the hat. And I was like, hell yeah, love that. I like it. So, yeah, it's it's just a reminder, right, like, that upward focus, at least for me, remembering um, who I belong to and why I'm here, right? Like, I'm I'm nothing without him. I'm a busted up piece of shit without him. And so maintaining that vertical alignment and remembering that uh, every breath that I have is his. These hands are his. This table's his. That truck outside that I drove here is his. This, you know, it's it's all his, and so I should be doing my absolute best to be working in the direction of his will rather than my own. And where the really good stuff happens is when my will and his will are in alignment. And then there's there's so much blessing that comes out of that. Like uh, Deuteronomy 28: If you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh your, your Elohim, the Lord your God then you will be blessed. If you diligently obey, if you do what dad told you to do, it, go, it will go well for you while you're living inside of his house. And so remembering for me, acknowledging for me, I live in his house. I'm his son. He's in charge. But if I just freaking do what dad told me to do, it's going to go really well for me, better than I can even comprehend how well it's going to go for me. And so it's, it's just a remembrance it's also Hebrew IFF, man. Okay, we were gonna, I was gonna we were gonna talk about that one next. Send it. So, how long have you been walking this path? <sighs> Five, almost six years. That seems like a really short time. Yeah. For as fast as you can put it out, you have a photographic memory. I don't know, uh, but I do know um, everybody who who I do life with tells me that I have a freaky brain. Uh, Did, were you able to just, could you just play the drums when you picked the sticks up the first time? Yeah. Yeah. So um, a part of that is um, the way that my brain works. I'm really good at pattern recognition. It, it helps me with intelligence analysis. It helps me in the operating of businesses. It helps me in the word. There's a bunch of patterns in the word. Drumming is just patterns. Drumming is just math in motion. And so some of those things have just, just come naturally to me. Um but as far as like retention of what the word says, I'm on uh, my ninth read through of the Bible right now uh, in the last five or so years since coming to Oklahoma uh, when I started to keep track of it. And I used to read the Bible so that I could weaponize it against believers because I was not one so that I could find all the, well, you know, there's a comma here when there shouldn't be. And this is a bad translation and this doesn't, you know, and it just to weapon to, to be an asshole. Um, and so I wasn't reading with the right heart set and mindset. And once I started approaching it with the right heart set and mindset, it just started sticking. But more than that, what makes it stick for me 
is I don't just read it. I do what it says to the best of my ability. And that sounds like, oh, how deep and pious and righteous. It's like, that's basic shit. Like you start keeping sheep in your front yard, all of a sudden, all the parables about sheep make sense. Right. You know? And so then it, it becomes like a, like a cheat code almost of like, oh, this is clearly what that means because I'm doing it, right? And there's a lot of people who will pay lip service to the word Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth, you know? Okay. I've never heard that. Dude, it, it, I think it's almost cheesy because I don't believe people when they say that because I don't see them doing it. They cherry pick. They pick and choose what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. And then that diminishes their credibility in my eyes. Because if it's the word of God and you believe in God, how come you're not doing what the freaking book says? Right? Like you're, It's an instruction manual for people. The whole book is how you love God with everything you've got and how you love your neighbor as yourself. It's Matthew twenty two thirty six. On this hangs all the Torah and the prophets. These are what I call the two prime directives from Messiah. It's like love God with everything you got. Deuteronomy six five. Just freaking love Him, right? Just start with that. Love Him, and love your neighbor as yourself. The thing is, if I tell God how I'm going to love Him, who's the God in this relationship? Me or Him? If I tell you how I'm going to love you, and we have different opinions of what love is, we're singing from two different sheets of music, we now have unequal weights and measures. That's unfair. Because now you're subject to my will and my opinion, and I'm subject to your will and your opinion. That makes it difficult to achieve a high level of ideological alignment, which means we can't go deep together. We can't do real meaningful stuff together. We can do surface level stuff. We can hang out. We can drink a beer. We can have a podcast. But like putting my back up against you in a firefight is going to be more difficult if your opinion of what love is and my opinion are different. And again, basic stuff like don't adulterate. If I surround myself with people who live that, I don't have to worry about you banging my wife. Yep. You don't have to worry about me banging your wife. Don't steal. This is basic stuff. Yeah, we only need, there's, there's, we don't need thousands of flaws. We only need yeah, 10. Yeah, exactly. And if you look at, you take those two prime directives, love the Lord your God with everything you got and love your neighbor as yourself. And you look at the 10 commandments. Half of those commandments are how you love God with everything you've got. There is no God but God. Don't take his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath, right? Easy stuff how you love your neighbor as yourself. And this is like, they're like building codes. It's the lowest level allowable uh, compliance that you need to have so that the building doesn't burn down, right? A lot of people look at building codes and they're like, well, it's up to code. It's like That's the minimum, <laughs> homie. Like that's, it's the minimum. And so like, if you think of it like building codes, don't steal. That is some basic shit. Like do not steal. Don't murder. Doesn't say don't kill says don't murder and that's an issue of the heart murder is premeditated i hated you in my heart before i took your life with my hands that's different than a service member or law enforcement right. or somebody defending their homestead that's different than killing sometimes killing needs to happen and it happens all throughout the bible but i'm not going to murder you i'm not going to bear false witness i'm not going to get your ass in trouble by saying some shit right. that never happened like these are basic things and then the, the 613 commands, laws, and right rulings that come after that, which is collectively called the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's only 613 laws. And a lot of people say, well, how could you live under that burden? Americans live under 4 million laws every day. <laughs> every day. I don't, I don't know a single person here at Self-Reliance Festival and that's ask, walking around, you know, they, they're bent over from the weight of these four million laws. And they ask for more. And they ask for more every day, right? Well, of these 613, like 200 of them are for the high priest. That's not you. That's not me. So we can just take those and set them over here. It's not for me. About 100 of them are for women. Also not us, right? And regardless of what the world says, never going to be us, right? Right. So that leaves like 300-ish laws, commands. And Torah means instruction, by the way. 300 instructions for us that if you're going to love God with everything that you've got and you're going to love your neighbor as yourself, do these things. And they're basic. 
if you're camping in the wilderness and you have to take a shit, go outside the camp, dig a hole, poop in the hole, cover it back up, clean seems, your shovel. Seems like common sense. That's yeah, Torah. Boy, Boy Scout stuff. Oh, the burden of the law, man. Like, if you if you have a flat roof and you hang out on your roof, put a rail up around it so people don't fall off and die. That's Torah. Right? It's super easy stuff, but it becomes, it's marketed as this burden. And so all that to say, why does it seem like I have some level of prowess with this stuff? It's because it, I do it. It's super easy. Like put a freaking handrail up. It, and that's, that's really one of them. Straight what, up. Question mark. Straight up. That's really one of them. Okay. So you said you, you started reading the Bible or, yeah. or the Torah, right? You, you go off the, by the Torah. Which so I... I believe every word from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22, the whole book, okay. is accurate and in play. Okay. Yep. So you said you started studying to use it as a weapon to disprove it. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the day you said you were not a believer? Do you remember the day when you realized you were? <sighs> That's a great question. Wow. Um, yeah. So... I was born and raised in the conservative Baptist church. Me too. And I was looking around at all these people on Sunday morning that were pretending. I knew what they were doing the other six days a week. And they were adulterating. They were lying. They were you, cheating. You can see it in any of the 123 churches here. Yep. Well, maybe, maybe there's a and, few you can't, but a lot And of them. so I was like... If this is what it means to be a Christian, I don't want to do this. These people are assholes. And I was younger at the time. Didn't have the self-awareness that I have now to realize people, including me, are assholes, right? But I was like, I don't want to be a part of that. So I turned and ran the other direction. Ended up playing drums in uh, satanic heavy metal bands for a decade. Was it really a satanic? Like, yeah, like straight up. Hail I'm, Satan kind of I'm, shit. Yeah, I'm covered in it. I'm covered in tattoos of that shit. Um, my... Favorite thing on planet Earth at that time, other than heavy metal, was cocaine and whiskey. And I was in a really bad spot. Um, I was, uh, I had decided to give up coke. And <clears throat> the coming down from that, the weeks following that were terrible. And um, I, there, there's suicidal ideation, and then there's I have a plan, Right. And I was moving from suicidal ideation to I've fucking had enough. I, I'm not doing this anymore. If, again, it, we create these ultimatums for ourselves. If this was, if this is what it means to be alive, I'm not doing this anymore. And uh, I had my girlfriend at the time got into a huge fight with her in upstate New York. And the house we lived in was in the middle of the woods, like way back in the woods. And it was pouring rain. It was... Uh, cold rain like 34 degrees outside pouring rain and I stormed out of the house and I was going to get in my truck that was parked about 50 yards away and I was going to go kill myself I was like, just had enough and I was walking to the truck and I had uh I was soaked the moment I stepped outside it's just pouring rain and as I'm walking out to the truck there's a little singular dot of white light it's dark it's light kind of moving in and out through the trees. And so I stop, and I'm now probably 20 feet from my truck, and this thing comes out from the trees and explodes in this just bright ball of white light. What was it? It was the only angel I've ever seen in my life. 15 foot tall, holding the sword, so bright, so beautiful that I couldn't look directly at it. And, uh, overwhelmingly felt love and the message that I got was we see you like you're not alone we see you it's okay and dude I was just weeping and it felt like I stood there for an hour in the presence of this thing I have no idea how long it was but it, it felt like an hour and then as quickly as it appeared it disappeared and I was beside myself. I went and got in my truck, and I put my head on the steering wheel. I started weeping. And I realized 
that the tops of my jeans were getting wet from my tears. And then I realized that was the only wet clothing, only place my clothing was wet. It is pissing rain outside. I was soaking wet the moment I stepped out the front door. And now I sit in my truck and the only wet that I have on me is from where my tears are falling in my lap. I cried even harder after that. And then so at that point, I knew God, Yah, whatever you want to call him, I knew he was real. I'd seen it with my own eyes. This is undeniable. And I was not in a position at that. I was not strong enough or smart enough at that point to teshuva, repent. Teshuva means to turn from. But it was the beginning. And then fast forward, I met my wife many years later in uh, North Texas. And uh, we were living in this piece of shit house in North Texas. Should have been hit with a bulldozer. It was terrible. But whatever. It is what it is, right? She was there with you. She, Yeah. We had a family. Things were good. Bills were paid. And um, my son was having a birthday party in like second grade or something. So all the little kids come over to play in the front yard, smack the pinata with a stick. You know, that's going on. And um, there was this really just lovely lady who was the uh, the mother of one of the kids who had been invited to come over. And we just, you know when you instantly vibe with somebody? Yeah. Like she was super cool. Her, her name was. I knew it. I knew it when I went to Kentucky. Yeah. I knew it before. But I had to see. Right. Yeah, because seeing with your own eyes is, is something, right? So this woman, Brooke, she said, hey, um, she mentioned that they were moving. We're like, please don't move. We just met you. You're awesome. Like, She's like, no, no, no. They live two blocks away. And it's like, we're moving from this corner of the four-way intersection to this corner of the four-way intersection, like just across the street. It's like, awesome. I've got trucks, trailers, manpower. You know, let me know when. I'll come over and give you a hand. And she said, okay, that'd be great. We're doing it on this date. Awesome. I'll be there, right? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. I will be there. And then she said, "Um, hey, I hope I'm not being too forward, but my husband Michael is the associate pastor at this little church here in town, and uh, he's given the message this Sunday I would love it if you would be our guests. If you can't or you won't, that's okay. Uh, I'd still like to be friends with y'all, but it, it would really mean something to me if you could come and hear Michael speak, which, by the way, is the <laughs> perfect way to invite somebody to church. Was it her inviting you or somebody inviting you through her? Oh, it's, it was the father used them for sure. Um, and so my wife had a death in her extended family, shortly thereafter and so she and the kids are out of town and it was just me at the house so sunday morning rolls around and like service starts at 10 30 i'm up ass crack of dawn every day you know so i get up i drink a pot of coffee and i'm nervously pacing the house like am, am i actually going to go to church yep and so i put on my church clothes and i changed out of my church clothes i put on i changed three times and finally, I was like, I'm not dressing up, man. I'm, I'm boots and blue jeans. If that's not going to work for church, I don't want to be there, right? So I go to church. I finally decide I'm going to church. And I walked in that church. It was a little church in the cafetorium of a middle school. And it was, uh, <clears throat> I walked in and I sat dead center, front row. And the pastor preached the word. And it, it was, he was just preaching from the Bible. And, bro, I shook violently for an hour because I don't have a fight or flight. I have a fight or fight. And I wanted to get up and run out of that room. The shit that was still inside of me could not stand to be in the presence of what the good, the light that was in that room. And, uh... The moment he was done, finishes the prayer, amen, dude, I got up and ran out of the room, and I got in the truck, and I drove home, and my wife had come back from being out of town by this point, and I said, babe, uh, this is going to sound crazy, but I need you to go with me to church next weekend, 
she's looking at me like, who the hell are you? <laughs> you know, you are not the guy that I left. I said, look, we got to go. She's like, okay, we'll go. So the next weekend we go, we sit right front and center again and I'm holding her hand and she's holding mine. We're both just sitting there just shaking and we get done and we get back out in the truck in the parking lot. I said, babe, what do you think about that? She goes, oh God, I hated it. I said, yeah, me too. She goes, we got to come back. I'm like, I know. And so we went back the third weekend. And as I was leaving the third time, the pastor comes up to me, uh, introduces himself. Hi, I'm Pastor Dave. And he says, um, I understand you play drums. I go, oh, shit, here we go. Because they didn't have a drummer in their worship band. I'm like, yeah, I play drums. And he said, uh, we've been praying for a drummer for two years. I'm like, okay. He said, would you prayerfully consider joining the worship team? I grew up in a church. That's a direct order from a pastor, right? <laughs> like prayerfully consider means I need you to do this. I said, yeah, I'll, I will do that. I will go home and prayerfully consider this. So we get home that evening. I'm sitting on the couch and uh, tell my wife, I'm like, I don't want to do this. Well, then don't do it. I said, but I have to do this. She's like, then do it. Like, but I don't want to do it. She's like, well, pick one. Shut up and pick one. I'm, I love my wife. She's awesome. Like, all right, I know how to fix this situation. The pastor would give me his email. So I go and find videos of me playing in bands back in the day. <laughs> and all he said was and awesome. I sent this guy an email of a half a dozen tracks of just straight up heathen metal. Like, that'll fix him. Well, he forwarded that to the worship leader. And 15 minutes later, I got an email back from the worship leader that said, hell yeah, get this guy. He's awesome. And that was the beginning. Um, so I would take my, it took 17 trips to carry my drum set from the double doors at the back of the cafetorium up to the stage and set it up. I'm talking, this is church drumming, but I'm bringing yeah. double kick drums, toms, yeah. floor toms, huge cymbals, the whole nine. And uh, so we started, I started playing worship music and the, the father used that as an inroad to my heart. And uh, I would, I would play, we'd be up there the first, usually play four songs at the intro and then the associate pastor comes up and gives the announcements and the pastor comes up, preaches a word and then there's a closing song, everybody prays, everybody goes home. You know, standard pattern happens, you know at a hundred thousand different churches every Sunday that f those first four songs, man, I would four count count in. And, uh, the next thing I would know we'd be done. It'd be mm -hmm. the last note of the last song. And I'm, I'm like having out of body experiences while this is happening. And people are coming up to me afterwards going, dude, I've never heard anybody play that song like that before. That was incredible, man. That was awesome. I'm like, I don't even know what I did. I wasn't here for that. Uh, and then oh, about a year later, I got baptized in that church and rebaptized because I'd been baptized as a, a young man. And baptism is a choice that one makes to outwardly express, to confess an inward change of the heart with the acceptance of Messiah. It, uh, baptism also predates Messiah. It's called a mikvah in the Old Testament. It's a ritual cleansing for the removal of sin. And so I got baptized and about six months later, and it, and it was, I could feel the father working in my life. I could feel the changes taking place. And about six months later, that little church, the sermon started changing. Instead of just reading the Bible, we started getting these self-help sermons, you know, three reasons, three ways that you can love your brother in the Lord this week. I'm like, let's just read the freaking book, man. Like the, Read the book, do what it says. And it turned into self-help, motivational speaker bullshit. And I told my wife, I said, if this is the way it's going to be, we're not going to go to church here anymore. I can read the Bible at home. And so we did. And for six months after that, we didn't go to church. One Sunday morning, I wake up, and the Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit is just like a ton of bricks 
the top of my chest saying, you're going to church. I'm like, I don't do that anymore. Boy, did I stutter, get dressed. <laughs> you're going to church. So I looked at my wife. I said, hey, babe, get dressed. We're going to church. She said, we don't do that anymore. Did I stutter, get dressed, we're going to church. So we showed up. And like I said, we would always sit front and center. That's where we sat. There was always an empty chair for me right up front while I was drumming. My wife and kids would be sitting there. I'd come off the stage and just sit right up front. So I wanted to be that close. I wanted to be able to just see the mannerisms of the pastor while he was teaching, right? Well, we haven't been there in a half a year. So we get there, and uh, the only seats that are left are all the way at the back. I believe that was the hand of the Father. Because that morning unbeknownst to me or anybody else, the pastor and the eldership had been quietly at war with one another for a year and a half, and it all came to a head that morning at church. And the pastor started yelling from the pulpit, and the elders started yelling back from the seats, and I watched 200 people in a church whose motto was, that's what family does. These people were family. I watched 200 people literally get up and switch sides. And I watched this church fall apart in a moment because of the egos of men. And I was so pissed. And I am great at being furious. I was so pissed. I looked at my wife. I was like, get in the truck. We're out. And I went home. And I was just furious. Because at this point, I was a believer I was saved. My wife wasn't. And I'm screaming at the father. How am I supposed to reach her? There's not even a church that I can take her to anymore. Well, come to find out later, nobody's job but mine, right? So, but I, in that moment, I only had three things. I knew that God was real. I knew that his son, Yeshua, Messiah, was real. And I knew that his word was true. That's all I had. So I started reading the Bible for myself at home. And uh, from the beginning, where should I start? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Okay, I'll start there. I started reading and reading and reading. I would see all these things in there. I'm like, nobody ever told me this before. And I'd get even more pissed. How come nobody told me this? And then the father would just hit me like, hey, asshole, you're somebody. You own this book. It's not my fault or anybody else's that you would only read it for an hour on Sunday morning. How long have you owned this book and you've never opened it on your own? Roger that. Thanks for the rebuke, Dad. So I kept reading and kept reading. And I would see things in there like, a law forever throughout all your generations and all your dwellings. Hmm. Interesting. I'd keep reading and I'd keep reading and I'd keep reading. And I came to an understanding, reading all the way from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, that all of this is true and that the doctrines that are taught in modern Christendom, that we don't have to do that Old Testament stuff, is bullshit. And that Messiah never said anything like that. And that the words of others, for example, Shaul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 2, where people will say, well, it was nailed to the cross. The law was nailed to the cross. That's not at all what it says. It says the doctrines and dogmas of men, your religious bullshit was nailed to the cross. Therefore, let no man judge you in eating or drinking or the keeping of Sabbaths or new moons or high holy days. Therefore... Don't let anybody judge you when you do what dad told you to do in the beginning of the book. And on and on and on. I can quote scriptures all day. But I started doing these things. I started keeping spot. I started eating clean. You know, no, no pork, no catfish, no shellfish. Um, and my wife is like, what in the hell is going on here? What are you doing? And this whole time I'm praying, I'm like, Father, I just... I need to reach this woman, and it feels like we're getting even farther apart now. And uh, a buddy of mine, Squid, had invited me like 10 times to his new church, little church, 
little time. I mean, it's the size of this room, little church. He's like, but you got to come. It's like the pastor's on fire. We read straight from the word. You got to come. I'm like, buddy, I just got out of a bad relationship with a church. So I'm not ready to get into another one, you know? He's like, you got to come. And finally, he called me forcefully one Sunday morning. And he's like, I'm not going to ask you again. You've got to come to church. It's like, all right. I respect you enough that. How did he know? The spirit. So we go to church. And this place is four blocks from my house, right? Like what you need is right in front of you the whole time, right? So we go to this church. And they have a little worship team and they, you know, they do their intro song and their announcements and the pastor gets up and starts preaching. And he stops about five minutes in. And he says, I can feel that there's somebody in this room that doesn't know Messiah. So I'd like us all, we're just going to close our eyes and pray together. And uh, if you don't know Messiah, but you want to, I want you to just pray this prayer with me. And I'm holding my wife's hand. And she's praying out loud next to me. I had no idea the weight that I had been carrying for her that whole time. And it just lifted. And I was full of joy. Because now this woman that I love and that I'm blessed to have stewardship over in this life, I know that she will be in the next life. And I was just filled with tears. I was crushed in the best way possible. That was the last time I stepped foot in a Sunday church. Not, I ain't been invited back to another one. <laughs> but, uh, so I keep reading the word, reading the word. And I'm seeing all these things and all the doctrines that I had been taught my whole life in the church. I'm reading the proof text for these doctrines in context and realizing these doctrines are bullshit. That's not what that means. Because if you go two verses up and two verses down, it negates this one cherry-picked verse that has become this doctrine. So I start keeping the Torah. It's just basic stuff. Observe the Sabbath. Eat clean food. Observe the high holy days, the appointed times. Wear the tzitzit, the tassels, as a reminder to do what Dad told you to do. Love the Lord your God with everything you got. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you have more problems, if you need answers, uh, we got 613 click here for more helps. It's basic shit, right? And the Torah is about the preservation of life. But I did not know at that point that anybody else understood this because I had no fellowship. I wasn't talking to anybody about it. And the few people that I had even attempted to, to broach the subject with thought I was batshit crazy. So I was all alone. And I would come home from work one night, and I was doing the dishes in the kitchen, and uh, our coffee pot was to the left of the sink, and I'd put my phone on top of the coffee pot and watch YouTube videos while I was doing dishes just to pass the time. And so I'd watched a Viking preparedness video on... Just randomly? Just randomly. And the next up video was from uh, Shofar Mountain. Mm. It was a sermon titled, Withdraw and Prepare... And I was like, that's the same guy on this channel from that channel. Okay, so I click it. I had no context for who Pastor Joe Fox of Viking Preparedness was. So I'm, watch, I'm listening to this sermon, and everything he's saying is lining up with everything that I had been reading in the Word. I was so overcome. I remember, I remember the dish that I was washing white dish with a yellow border around the edge of it I threw it into the sink and I looked through the roof up at the father and I was like is this what you need me to see is this what you need me to hear yeah copy that I got so overwhelmed dude I ended up like like I ran out of my kitchen and into the hallway and I put my back up against the wall in the hallway and just kind of collapsed into a pile I just wept because that was the first time I knew I'm not alone. I might be batshit crazy, but not because of this. I'm not the only person who has this understanding. 
And then again, in hindsight, it's like, yeah, kid, I love you, but you're not that special. I'm not going to tell just you, <laughs> right? Like, and so, and again, that's Torah in the mouths of two or three, let a thing be established. And so, you know, when did I first believe 20 minute answer to your question? When did I first believe what? I'd always been indoctrinated into the concept that God was real. I did not experience him as real until the moment I was ready to kill myself. Like ready, ready, not mm -hmm. just thinking about it. Ready, right now, we're doing this. That was the first experience with him that I had. And then as I got to know him better, I came to believe in his son and I dedicated my life to him by the blood of his son. And then when I started to walk in his commands, it was undeniable how real he is. His word will not return to him void. What he says he means. Deuteronomy 28, if, if you diligently obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim, then you will be blessed. If you do not, then you will be cursed. But what is his voice? He loved us enough to write it down for us. We call it the Bible. And it's basic. It's easy. Yeshua says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. It is. I'm suffering under the weight of no laws. It's a blessing. It's not a curse. But you have to have, one has to have the balls enough to break the paradigms of all the things that they've been taught over the years and to truly examine what do I know versus what I think I know? What is truth? What, at least for me, what over time has proven itself to be true? Well, when I spent a decade of apostasy at war with the creator, I was not diligently obeying his voice and I was super cursed. Yup, that checks out. He said that. Then I started obeying his voice and I'm blessed beyond measure. Me, this busted up piece of shit. I got five businesses, I've got two ministries, I've got the best wife on the face of the earth, I've got three awesome kids, I'm surrounded by people who love me, I'm not worried about how I'm going to pay my bills tomorrow, I have everything I need and most of what I want, and I get to do cool shit like this. Like, it's basic. And he does all of that because he loves us. And that's the hard part I think that most people have. Like, how could he love me? Like, I was at war with him. I was at war with him. And he still loved me enough to kill himself for me so that I could come home again. Yeah, I'm not worthy of that. And that's the point. None of us are. You're not worthy of it. You can't work your way into that. It's just love. He loves us. He doesn't want us to die. That's why he made a way for us to come home again. And a lot of people who have had messed up relationships with their worldly fathers, myself included, have a very hard time accepting the concept of a heavenly father. Because if an earthly father could hurt me that bad, why would I want the creator of the universe to have that authority over me? But he does. He is. Just like gravity is. You don't have to believe in him for him to be real. You don't have to believe in gravity if we go up on top of your shop and jump off of it, we're going to bust our damn legs, right? Whether you believe in gravity or not, it believes in you, right? If you transgress the law of gravity, you will be cursed with two busted femurs. If you're obedient to the law of gravity and don't jump off the freaking roof, <laughs> you're going to be blessed, right? So onboarding the concept, because it, you have to look, you're forced to look deeply at who you are and how you've come to be when you realize that it is because of love that you've been redeemed. And if you were redeemed for what purpose? To be his hands and feet, to do meaningful things, to use the you that he fearfully and wonderfully made in his image for his glory and for the betterment of mankind. And as a byproduct, you will be richly blessed in the doing of that's that sounds too good to be true. And it is unless you're talking about the creator because there's nobody else in existence who can make you that offer and have it be true. And so the skeptical side and the self deprecating side of like, I suck who could possibly love me that much. 
Yeah. And he does. And he did from before you were born. And he loves you until the day that you die. And it breaks his heart when you decide to step outside of his house. And he doesn't want to kill you. But he will. Because if he didn't, he'd be unjust. Because he said he would. And his word will not return to him void. Long answer to your short question. So where do you do church? <laughs> the woods. <laughs> we meet We meet for churches where two or more are gathered in my name. And uh, praise you we've got a lot more than two people who gather now. But we literally will meet in the woods. We'll meet in a hayfield. We bring our, our camp chairs and our Bibles and a potluck dinner. We meet in our refuge building sometimes. Um, we're growing to the point now, our assembly, we call it an assembly because um, we're just a, a group of brothers and sisters. There's very little hierarchy. Um, and, and when we study, the way we study is one man does not get up and preach the word at us. We do a midrash. So we just start reading the word. We just start kicking it around. And if people are brand new and they have questions, they're allowed to raise their hand and go, wait a minute, WTF, what does that even mean? We're like, let me unpack that for you. And we kick it around. Some, some of our Bible studies are epic. I'm talking like four, five, six hours of just trying to get through a few chapters in the Word. But it's so rich because we end up cross-referencing from Genesis all the way to Revelation and back and forth again because there's so much congruency in the Word. And so because the Father has blessed our assembly, we're running out of spots where we actually fit now. I built a, a gazebo, 24 by 24 gazebo in my backyard so that we could fellowship underneath it. The last time we attempted that, there were three concentric rings of camp chairs around the gazebo, uh, which is amazing. It's an absolute blessing. And I, I honestly struggle with, should we even like f attempt to find a building to meet in because I don't ever want to, I don't want to lose the usness of us. And, uh, I've had negative experiences with faith groups and buildings in the past. Right. So the, the, probably some of my own training scars there, but, uh, we're running out of places that will fit us. But right now we meet in the refuge building, uh, refuge medical building, or, um, We'll meet uh, literally in the woods uh, or somebody's front yard or a hay field. It just depends on the weather and what's going on. But again, we're, we're kind of, we have a homestead tactical vibe. We're very comfortable being outside. Our kids are very comfortable being outside and we just get together and fellowship. And you put some of this <clears throat> on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So has to have happened how many times have people just kind of shown up to be part of this unannounced in there mm, on multiple occasions um i see it here yeah so there's a line to walk there um for us between these people really need help some people need help yeah and that's why they're coming some people need intervention we've and we have helped those people who show up who need help we have intervened with those people who need intervention we the last guy who just showed up i love my brothers literally stopped what they were doing witnessed to that guy for three hours then drove him to the nearest body of water and baptized him that's badass which we have an interesting vibe at refuge <laughs> you know what i mean yeah um and then some people some people show up and they are supposed to be there, but there, there's kind of a, there's a, a code of conduct here. Like if people want to be us, they want to fellowship with us, like just reach out first. Um, because um, our wives and kids are there and I'm sure you're a great person, but I don't know you. Right? Like, let's get to know each other first. Um, we used to, um, Shabbats would just be open. Like anybody could just show up. There's too many weird people out there for that to be a thing. And we yeah. do we do too many high profile things for that to be a thing as well. So and then you have to you have to balance the practicality of that against the fact that like 
it's Yah's word, not my word. It's Yah's Shabbat, not my Shabbat. It's Yah's building, not my building. So, you know, there's be wise as serpents, then gentle as doves, right? And so I don't want to... I don't want to put up barriers that become stumbling blocks to the good people who need to be there because the father told them to be. But I also know there's freaking weirdos out there that I will absolutely cavitate their dome Mm -hmm. if they try and do weird shit around me and the people that I love. And, oh, but uh, even a lot of that is the spirit. It's the wisdom and discernment of the spirit. When you, you look at somebody and go, they're us, they need to be here or that person needs help right now. Or uh, this guy's coming down off of a high, he needs intervention um, or nope, that person's wicked and they've got evil in their heart. They don't need to be here. And then again, in the mouths of two or three, because I'm surrounded by people. And if I start looking around or people are looking at me, they're like, mm, yeah, this guy's got to yeah. go. Tell me about identify friend or foe. <laughs> IFF. So, um, numbers 1537 says you will put zitziot tassels on the uh, on the corners of your garment oh, with four, the bl- four corners. The four corners. Uh, back then, people wore squares. Like imagine a poncho, right? Okay. We don't really dress that way anymore. Uh, but you will put tassels on the four corners of your garment with a blue cord, a blue thread through them. Blue is the color of set apartness, holiness, uh, sanctification unto unto Yah. And you will put these on so that you will remember and do all the commands of Yahweh your Elohim. So the zitziot, the tassels, are a remembrance. They're, I'm telling you, there are people who still have all of their teeth in their head right now because I had my zitziot <laughs> on. Because, again, I'm good at being pissed. I, I have a natural tendency towards anger. It's something I've had to work very hard to pull back from over the years. Um... But there's some people, man, like, you ever just meet somebody like, this guy needs to get his ass kicked, and I might be the guy to do it today. Yeah. Right? Well, I can reach down and grab a tassel and remember, hey, love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Now, if that guy wants to start some shit, I'm happy to end it. Like, self-defense is good to go. Matthew uh, 22, 36, he who does not have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Right? And I would submit that the sword, the, the close combat weapon today is a handgun. Right? So whatever, but we wear the tassels so that we remember and do all the commands of Yah. Uh, same, kind of the same thing with the hat. Um, you know, and there's there's certain brands, right? Like if I'm out in the wild and I see somebody with an SOE shirt on, I can probably deduce a lot about that person just by the fact that they have an SOE shirt on, or a pair of Origin jeans, right? Or uh, They've got a refuge hoodie on, whatever it is, right. right? I can make assumptions about those people. It's the same thing with the tassels or the Shema hat or anything else you might have. Um, but the the tassels, zitziot, are an outward expression, just like baptism is. It's an outward expression of an inward heart condition. And so if I see somebody wearing tassels, that tells me that they're keeping commands to the best of their ability. And so that, we joke, that's like Hebrew IFF. Mm -hmm. I see somebody wearing tassels. Even if I don't know them, that means that they understand enough about the word and are committed enough to the word that they made the personal decision to put those tassels on. And In the New Testament, there's a story of a woman with the issue of blood. She's bleeding for 12 years, can't stop bleeding. And in the King James, it says that she reaches out and touches the hem of Yeshua's garment. It's not the word hem. It's tassels, zitziot. She touched his zitzit, and she was healed. Well, First Peter 2.21, For this you are called, that Messiah, having suffered for your sins, that you might walk in his steps, that in him there is no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth, that being reviled did not revile in return, who hung upon the timber for your sins, for you were dead in your sins. You were like sheep who had gone astray, and have now been returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. So you're called to walk the way Messiah walked. Well, that would beg the question of, and you see these dumb little bracelets, what would Jesus do? Read the Gospels. Well, clearly, he'd wear tassels. That's what the woman touched when she reached out and was healed, which is the embodiment of a remembrance to do the commands. Wow, that's interesting. 
you can read in the Gospels, that he goes up to Jerusalem for Pesach, Passover, and for Sukkot, and for Shavuot. He ate clean. We know he ate clean. He was a Yehudi man, a Jew from the tribe of Judah. He had to be in order to be the prophesied Messiah, the Mashiach from the Old Testament, who comes as a righteous king in the line of King David. King David was in the line of Judah, the tribe of Judah. And that's backed up in Matthew chapter 1, the first chapter in the New Testament. So, he ate clean. He observed the feasts. We know he kept Shabbat because in all four Gospels it talks about him going to the temple on Shabbat as was his custom. Okay, and he wore zitziot. So those become kind of like the four cornerstones for me that if I'm supposed to walk the way Messiah walked, and we know that in him there is no sin. Well, if the cornerstone of his ministry was the removal of sin, it would be really good to know what sin is. And that's something that I struggled with for years. What's sin? And people tell you, well, it's missing the mark. And I actually had somebody earlier, earlier today tell me, oh, it's an archery term. It means to miss the mark. What's the mark? Well, if we let the Bible interpret the Bible, New Testament, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, sin is lawlessness, and all who do sin do lawlessness. Getting back to the law was not nailed to the cross your bullshit religion, doctrine, and dogmas were. It was like a mic drop the first time I saw that. Reading the word, sin is lawlessness. We are not supposed to be lawless. If I'm supposed to walk, for this you were called, if you're called to this walk with Messiah, that you might walk in his steps. Well, what did he do? There was no sin in him, so he wasn't lawless. He wore the tassels. Kept the feasts, kept Shabbat, ate clean. Mm. Yep, I can start with that. And the thing to realize, because a lot of people say with, with this walk, with this faith, that you're denying the grace of Jesus when you do that. Negative. Shall we sin all the more so that grace may abound? Shaul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul. No. God forbid we sin all the more because of grace. Again, what is sin? Shall we be lawless all the more? so that grace may abound. No, God forbid. By grace through faith, we are saved, lest any man should boast. My works are not going to get me back into the presence of the Father because I can't do this life perfectly. If I could do this life perfectly, I wouldn't need a Messiah. Messiah means anointed. He's the intercessor. It's explained in the book of Hebrews chapter 8. Interestingly, of a renewed covenant between the Father and Israel. So it would make a lot of sense to be Israel if the renewed covenant under Messiah is between the Father and Israel. It would make a lot of sense to be Israel. It's Genesis 32. Israel is he who is struggling with Elohim, God. He who is overcoming with Elohim and he who is ruling with Elohim. Well, shit, I struggled with him for most of my life. Then I overcame by the blood of Messiah. Definitely did not put a Glock in my mouth and pull the trigger, even though that seemed like the only option that I had. And now, because of diligence and obedience, I am ruling with Elohim. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, I believe it is, we are called to be a nation of kings and priests unto Yah. That sounds like ruler to me. So Israel is he who is struggling with, overcoming with, and ruling with Elohim. And then if you go and look at all the promises that Messiah makes in Revelation, end of the book, not the beginning of the book, Genesis, the end of the book, Revelations chapter 2, 3, and 4, Messiah says, to he who overcomes, I will give a new name. To he who overcomes, I will give the bread of life. It's like 14 times, to he who overcomes, Damn, it would be good to know what he who overcomes is, Israel. Make a renewed covenant with the house of Israel. This is what Shaul of Tarsus, the apostle Paul, talks about in Romans chapter 11, being grafted into the tree of life. The tree of life is a Hebrew euphemism for Israel. And he talks about how some of the natural branches, these tribes who went into the diaspora and fell away, some of the natural branches have been torn off so that you might be grafted in 
Gentile believer in Messiah who's now part of the family of Israel, who Yeshua says, I come first, but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Do not boast against the other branches. And remember that the root, Israel, bears you, the branch, the Gentile believer, not the other way around. And if the natural branches were removed, how much more so you, if you get out of line? New Living Bear translation. So, giant ass rabbit hole there. But um, we are not, we don't do these things because we want to work our way into the presence of the Father. We do these things out of thankfulness and remembrance and obedience to Messiah after whom we walk because we've been called. And that's a clear misunderstanding of people who are of the the run-of-the-mill Christian persuasion thinking that we're trying to do works so that we can be saved. No, we do works because we've been saved. And even then, people don't understand that word saved. The word is redeemed, and there is a Torah for redemption. It is when one man cannot pay a debt, a brother, this is why Yah had to become flesh, a brother will pay his debt for him. But when he does, let's say I can't pay my debt and you redeem me. <clears throat> you pay my debt. I now become a bond servant in your house for seven years. You are the master of the house. I am a servant in the master's house for seven years. At the end of seven years, either I leave and you as the master of the house you bless me richly from your flocks and your herds and your oil and your wine the, with the best of the best. And you, I'm coming out from underneath your covering now, but you send me out with a little bit of my own covering from yours, your storehouses, and I go out into the world and make my own way. Or I confess my love for the master at the doorpost of the house. The same doorpost where the blood of the lamb goes on Passover. The same doorpost where the mezuzah is with the Shema, which is the prayer on my hat. Same doorpost. I confess my love for the master at the doorpost. And you poke a hole in my ear and you hang a ring in it. Because this was before wedding rings. The ring signifies a covenant. I am now a bondservant in your house forever. When I admit my love for the master and I come into covenant, I'm now a bondservant in the house forever. I'm under your covering forever. That's the Torah for redemption. And so if Yeshua was without sin, he was without lawlessness. He kept the Torah. When he redeemed us into the house, we became bondservants in the house of Yah. Okay? He's our brother, our kinsman, redeemer. We're here now. We work at the direction of the master. It's up to us at the end of a time if we're going to stay. We can leave. And we'll be richly blessed if we do. Or we can confess our love for the master and stay in the house forever. So people misunderstand that word saved, redeemed. They don't understand because they don't read the Old Testament what exactly it means. I've never heard almost all of that. <laughs> Praise Yah. So if somebody wants to hear more, where is that? Uh, I got a little YouTube channel called Bear Independent, B E A R Independent. If uh, you can't spell independent, Google it. <laughs> yeah, well, I noticed you <laughs> put the spelling up. People they just they can't find it. Yeah, it's Bear Independent on the YouTube channel. I do. Um, I have read every word of the New Testament on camera. I have read all of the fifty-two weekly Torah portions on camera. And I have read from Genesis chapter 1 to Jeremiah 34 on camera thus far. I'm working my way from Jeremiah through Second Chronicles. And my goal, in addition to the preparedness and the homesteading and the intel and all that, is to put these weekly Bible videos up each week and let the Bible interpret the Bible. What did, what did God say? What did Dad say? Because you and me can talk all day about what Dad said. But if we play the telephone game enough times, we're going to dilute mm -hmm. what dad said. So sooner or later, we got to go back and talk to dad, right? And so that's what I do on camera every week. And again, every word of the New Testament. So people will tell me I'm stuck in the Old Testament. I've read every word of the New Testament on camera, including Revelation. And then from Genesis to the middle of Jeremiah 
and every word of the 52 weekly Torah portions. And you basically get to see my understanding uh, grow over time over the last five years. So they're independent YouTube. And if that's not enough for them, there's some other content somewhere else. Yep. You're so good at this. What is it? Um, we have a Patreon channel. And there's uh, a lot. Yeah. There's a lot. But I try, I try, I have never monetized the word of Yah. Right. Um, a workman is worth their hire. Do not muzzle an ox while he treads out the grain. Yep, for sure. But um, if you're going to earn, earn. If you're going to give, give. I don't like to cross those two things. And so the Father has blessed me richly with my opportunities to earn, and therefore I don't need bullshit YouTube ad revenue uh, when I'm over here giving. I get it. The word is his. Um, but yes, we we have a Patreon channel where we talk about faith and preparedness and homesteading and all of that as well. Same name, Bear Independent. Is it your responsibility to put this message out and try to draw people? I don't know if it's draw people or is it up to them to seek it? Jeremiah 3.15, I shall raise up pastors, shepherds over you after my own heart listen to them i'm not a pastor i think you are a pastor well i, appreciate I know you that. don't i don't like the, i know you don't like the name of maybe we need a different term for it I, i'll take no shepherd, i think okay yes but i want to be your brother i want to help my brethren um Jeremiah 3.15, I shall raise up pastures over you after my own heart. I don't know if I'm that or not, but I don't feel, I cannot make you eat. I can set the table, I can prepare the food, and that's all Dad has asked me to do. He told me, I was walking around my yard one day, Again, pissed off, screaming at him because I knew there was something I was supposed to do, but I didn't know what it was. I was telling him, hey, I'm stupid. If you don't tell me what it is, I can't do it. So I need you to tell me what it is. Clear as a bell, I heard, read my word. I said, I am. He said, on camera, you idiot. I said, well, that's not what I signed up for. To which he responded, did I stutter? No, sir, you did not. So, I can set the table. My responsibility is to read the world. Read the word. Those that receive it, praise Yah. Those that don't, that's entirely up to you. That's not on me. Jonah was told to go to Nineveh and preach the word. Jonah was not told that 70,000 men would be saved. In fact, Jonah was pissed that they were because he didn't think that they deserved that salvation. I'm to read the word. What you do with it after that's up to you. It's between you and y'all. All right. So this wasn't the conversation I thought we were going to have. <laughs> I don't know what I thought, but I didn't think this. I'll be here for a few, for a few more days. Have you ever seen me do anything that you questioned? No. I don't think I've ever asked anybody that. I want to do things that people are proud of, but I don't think I've ever asked anybody if they've ever been disappointed. That's a deep question, John. No, nothing comes to mind. I but will. It, but if I did, I'd tell, tell you. Me, yeah. Because I can guarantee you, again, why I don't like being put up on a pedestal, I'm a man. I will fail you. It's just a matter of time. I've failed me enough times to know it's just a matter of time before I fail you. I'm not what's special in the relationship between me and Yah. He is. He's the living water. I'm a pipe. I'm infrastructure. The pipes aren't special. The pipes don't save people's lives. The water does. I'm just blessed that I get to be a pipe. Well, you're a pretty fucking good one. And you have people's attention. You had my attention. I don't, three years ago maybe. I'd met people who knew you. 
but they never told me who you were. We had people in common years ago, but until I don't even know why, but you popped up and after, and being there so fucking long and just popping up three years ago, I don't know why that happened. Really. It was probably Canada prepper, Canada dry prepper. I was probably watching his shit and that's why yours algorithmically came up, but I watched your shit religiously and Amanda watched it and we watched it together. It was just something that drew and I don't, I don't know if it's that or what, right? We can, whatever we can give credit or blame it on whoever. But I I just had to, when I heard you were in Kentucky, we had to go there and that's, I call you my friend and I actually, I mean that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we can go for a few more hours, but we'll we'll do another one. That was beautiful. Yeah, man, I'm talking about Willis, one of the Willis to try. My-